You ever feel like you've been lied to? When I found out this study existed, I was pumped. It's about time researchers are asking if we can do 120 grams per hour during exercise, and it's about time they're asking how we do it. Before we dive into the paper, I need to give you a little backdrop into the last 25 years in sports science. In the 80s and 90s, we were just infants in carb research. Gatorade had blown up in popularity. Gatorade is thirsty. Grab a canister or can. For that deep down body thirst. In the 2000s, we learned that 30 to 60 grams of glucose might be useful, but there was some really promising research showing 90 or more might have special utility for exercise lasting three hours or longer. Then for the last 15 years, nothing's really changed, except that the research was showing the benefit of higher carb intake rates. But that's not what was taught. That's not what was in textbooks. That's not even what leading journals published in their position stands. I was taught hard cap 90 an hour during exercise. And that's only for really long exercise. 60 glucose, 30 fructose, both hard capped. Any more causes gut issues. And I was taught even if it doesn't cause gut issues, it's still not useful for performance enhancement. I taught that. I taught that to my students. Every undergraduate exercise physiology and sport nutrition textbook in the world in the last decade has contained the numbers 60 and 90 and talks about when and how to use those nice round numbers. But then I wrote up a literature review on carbohydrate metabolism during and after exercise. I was gonna do my PhD on it. Lo and behold, I'd been lied to. If you've been following me for any length of time, you know I've been on a bit of a crusade to change the dogma. So when I saw this article, I was like, it's about time. Comparable exogenous carbohydrate oxidation during exercise when consuming 120 grams per hour in fluid, gel, jelly chew, or co-ingestion. My first thought was, sweet. Scientists are looking at intakes of 120 grams of carbs per hour. It's about time. Did they say equivalent results? whether it came from gel, fluid, or chew, that's not really what I would expect. I've always told folks that to max out carb consumption without GI issues, you wanna drink most of your carbs. So this study could be groundbreaking. Let's check it out. They had some cyclists come in and do a three hour ride followed by a short, hard effort at high power. The goal, to see how long they could last in that hard effort after three hours of riding. They compared four different fueling conditions plus a control group of just water. More importantly, they looked at how much of the consumed carbs were actually being burned during the exercise. Awesome, it all makes sense. The first condition was fluid carbs only, second condition gels only, third condition chews only, compared to a fourth condition, a mix of all three carb types. I mean, the title says it all. Here's the total energy burn from carbs. And yeah, it looks like all the 120 gram groups were really similar. Way better than water alone, of course, that's expected. Let's see, how does exogenous carb usage look? Did their bodies actually burn the same amount of what they took in between all four comparison groups? And wow, yeah, that exogenous carb burn graph is really clean. Oxidation efficiencies are all really close too. These all look like chews and gels matched fluid carb only. Super clean data, especially at first glance. It makes it seem like the studies in the past that have pretty reliably shown a difference between fluid carbs only and solid might have been less conclusive than we thought. I'm all for breaking down dogma, so let's keep going. Here's what substrate oxidation looked like. That is fat burn versus carb burn over time during the three hour ride. Carbs trend down about the same for all 120 gram per hour test groups, no matter the method. In the water only test, carb use drops actually below internal fat stores as the test goes on. That makes sense. Super clean again, tightly clustered test groups far away from a control group, which if you know anything about conducting research, super clean data is actually really hard to produce. And this smells almost too clean. Everything about this study was designed perfectly not to find statistical differences between meaningfully different test groups. And just a reminder, statistical significance in research terms is what allows research teams to say things like, these test conditions produce different outcomes. But that's not the same thing as these test conditions produce different enough outcomes that athletes should care about them. Sometimes things can be statistically significant and yet not meaningful. And other times, often in sports science, where small performance differences can easily be the difference between first and 10th, things can be meaningful, but not statistically significant which means that the researchers have to say, we found no significant difference between groups. Sad face. Usually research teams design studies to optimize their chances at finding statistical significance. In this study, from the high carbs the day before to high carb breakfast, to the just barely enough subjects to meet statistical power needs, to the super wide age and ability range in their subject pool, this study is all set up to lead the statistics to report that the four test groups were actually equal in their outcomes. That's 
unusual, the opposite of normal, actually. And it makes me want to ask questions. And using a, a water-only control group makes the difference between test conditions even smaller by visual comparison on all the graphs because they're closer together at the top because the scale is so large. The way this study was designed, the only way they wouldn't have concluded that these four test conditions were equal is if there were massive differences in performance because of the different carb types. Normally, in virtually every other study like this, the research team sets up the research to give them the best chance possible of teasing out statistical differences between conditions. If I were going to design a study to test between four different scenarios, I'd want to keep the athletes in the test groups as homogenous as possible to limit intersubject variability. Less between subject variability means you're more likely to be able to tease out small differences between the carb conditions because your group isn't so widely variable that your standard deviations are enormous and you lose statistical power. I'd want my control group more similar and more real world, like 60 grams of carbs per hour using fluid fuel that we know enhances performance over just water. But what's mind blowing here is that these guys know how to set up studies to test for group differences. They're legitimately experts at that. But these stats, the way they're all set up, wouldn't be likely to ever answer the question, are there small but meaningful differences between test conditions? When I run into things that are confusing in research, the first thing I do is ask, what's the motive? Why would someone want to do this? So let's play that game. Why would experts want to set up a study to not find any difference between gels, chews, and fluid carb consumption? Why would someone want to be able to claim that you can use any combination of products you like to hit your fueling goals and at such a high carb intake? Man, if that's not the best place funding disclosure I've ever seen, just buried by a gigantic block of text. Those are the longest paragraphs I've ever seen in a publication. I'm a PhD who enjoys nerding out about this stuff. And if I saw this page of text, I'd be bored before I ever made it through this page. So let's turn the page. It gets better. One of the authors is an actual employee of SIS. Two more of them are paid SIS consultants. Hmm. Where have I seen that gel shaped like that before? Who's the science guy at Never Second? Who's the head of the lab in paper number 20 that this study used for calculating their conveniently low subject number? And if you wanted to sell gels because they're the product that differentiates your company from the rest of the market, what would you do? How would you position your gels to be the gold standard backed by science? Five articles in the last two years looking at 120 grams per hour after 15 years of position stands and industry dogma saying 90 is the hard upper limit for hourly carb consumption. Who's this Itor Virbai guy who put out three of the first studies on specifically 120 grams per hour? I wonder if he's worked with any of the folks from this study. Wait, did he use the same gel icon just with the Gatorade logo on it? Let's check out his website. Nice and professional. But where have I seen those little running people before? Wait a second, is this the never second lead scientist promoting the work of one of his understudies named Itor? I'm sure it's in good faith. They probably don't have a close relationship and they're professionals. But why the Gatorade logo on Itor's study? Asker worked for Gatorade back when the science Gatorade said 90 and much of the science was published by Gatorade Sports Science Institute and partners of Gatorade. I'm sure it's nothing. There's probably lots of companies positioned well to sell products that make it easy to target nice round numbers like 120. Wait, you're saying there's only two? We need to check the math. 90 plus 30, it's 120. 40 plus 40 plus 40, it's 122. Surprise face. I'm sure that this is just an honest coincidence. They haven't planned the whole thing. When did those products come out anyway? Well, just recently, right before this study came out, but right after ITOR published his three studies. And the founder of Never Second has a long history of working with corporate interests like Pepsi and Gatorade. Nice. The paid SIS consultant who authored this paper. Oh, him too? Nestle? Power Bar? Nice. Scientists are ethical. They would never let profit motive influence the direction of their research or the questions they ask. You're going to start to hear more about 120, and you're going to hear that gels, chews, and fluid carbs function the same. And they might, but they might not. One thing's for sure though, 120 is not the limit, nor should it be everyone's target. There's nuance, individualization, differences between training sessions, some days more, some days less. Don't be roped into the next round of dogma. Hey, thanks for watching and if you don't want your friends to be roped into dogma either, share this video and yeah, thanks for being here. Appreciate you guys.